Nothing on earth is as beautiful as you You open my eyes to your wonders and do You capture my heart with this love Nothing on earth is as beautiful as you My soul, my soul, my say My soul, my soul, my say My soul, my soul, my say Beautiful one, I adore. Beautiful one, my soul has said. Beautiful one, I love you. Beautiful one, I adore. Beautiful one, my. Welcome, everyone. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your love and kindness tore through the shadow of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom from boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who sent me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken it. Chain, there's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Came the morning that sealed the promise, your very body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion Declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who sent me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. 
There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who sent me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living hope. We thank you. That, that hope that is planted within us does not disappoint us. <coughs> the hope of eternal life that's found in your Son, Jesus Christ. And so this morning, Lord, as we retell that story, as we hear as the children lead us into the, into the Christmas story, a reminder of the God who came to save, Emmanuel. Lord, speak to us through that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The children are going to be here in just a moment, but the band are just going to do that. So why don't we just turn and say hi to those we're sat next to. And as the children arrive, we'll be ready for the nativity in a second. Okay, oh dear, that's loud. Just as we uh, think the children are on their way in, but we've decided why don't we do the notices now, then they're done. Obviously they're very important, but, um, but we'll, um, we'll do them now and so the children can be ready and prepared uh, for what's coming. And I have to say, having seen the 915, it is fantastic. So good. Okay, um, so uh, you kick us off. Tam, what's happening this afternoon and this evening? Well, today is a really exciting Sunday because we have our carol services that eat this evening. We have nativity this morning, carol services that eat this evening, and we'd love for you to come. They're happening at 5 and 7.30, and it's a great opportunity to invite friends, people from the community. We usually have loads of visitors coming in, and um, it's a, yeah, a really special service. But we, what we also love to do is we love to serve mulled wine and mince pies. So we do ask if you're able to, to bring a box of mince pies. We already have loads stacked up in the kitchen ready, but we do have lots of people coming. So if you're able to bring a box of mince pies with you, please. It's going to be a beautiful evening. Really excited about tonight. Lovely service. Um, just again, just a reminder of our other services next Sunday. Uh, that's Christmas Eve. We have an 8 o'clock communion service and no 9.15 and 11. And then we have a 4 o'clock nativity service where every child can come and be part of the nativity story. Um, that's at 4 p.m. and then 11.30 our midnight communion. Then on Christmas Day we have 8 a.m. early morning communion and 9.15 and 11 o'clock worship together um, kind of Christmas celebrations. Um, and then the 31st of January, that's the following Sunday, so two weeks today, we um, have again an 8 o'clock communion service and then just an 11 a.m. service, which I'll be hosting and leading. I'm really looking forward to that. So just so you know, next Sunday, there are no 9.15 or 11 o'clock services. We've got the 4 o'clock, uh, 8 o'clock communion, 4 o'clock, and then midnight communion. 
Um, one more quick thing, for, quick thing from me is just on Vision Night, the children are actually, I'm going to do this in a moment because I think they're all looking ready to come in. So we're going to invite them in now. <laughs> if I make them stay in the foyer any longer, there may be a riot. <laughs> Maybe not. That's probably a bit dramatic. Welcome to The Impossible Promise, a Christmas story. My name is Hannah. And my name is Sophia, and we will be narrating this story today. There will be a lot of booming in this story, the sound everyone in the room will make together whenever, whenever God does something amazing. When you see the boom sign, all you need to do is throw your arms in the air and shout boom. Let's have a little practice. Boom. Excellent. Boom. Just like that, out of nowhere, there he was, an angel, and Mary was terrified. Maybe, maybe it was the suddenness of his arrival. Maybe it was the shock of the surprise. Maybe it was because he was no fat baby with wings, but a bright, shiny, otherworldly creature sent down from the throne of God. Or maybe it had to do with what he said. Don't be afraid. God is pleased with you and wants to do something amazing for you. So here's what's going to happen. He'll give birth to a son called Jesus. He'll be great. In fact, he'll be the son of God. It was the promise, the promise of Eve of a child that would crush the serpent's head. The promise of Abraham that for, though his father God would one day bless the world, the promise would finally come true and it sounded amazing. But Mary had a practical question, very practical. By the customs of her day, she was legally promised to be married to a man named Joseph, but they hadn't had their wedding yet. So she asked, quite rightly, I'm a virgin, how will I give birth to a son? And, quite rightly, Gabriel gave her an answer, a mysterious answer guaranteed to surprise her even further. God's power will overshadow you, and your son will be holy too. He'll be the son of God. It sounds amazing, I know. But your cousin Elizabeth is having a baby. She's six months pregnant, in fact, and as you know, she's very old. For God can do anything, even things that everyone else thinks is impossible. Then let me do this impossible thing for me. I will be his servant and do what he has asked me. And with that, and with that, just as suddenly as he had come, the angel disappeared. Boom. Boom! Just like that, out of nowhere, it was the last thing that Joseph wanted to hear. Mary, the woman that he had promised to marry, was expecting a baby, and there was no way this baby was his. What could he do? She had broken her promise, broken the legal engagement that her family had made with him, and worst of all, she had broken his heart. He could have embarrassed her and made a big deal out of what she had done. But Joseph was a good man and a kind man. He decided to end their engagement, but do it quietly. Before he could put his plan into action, however... Boom! He had a visit from an angel as well. The angel came to him at night in a dream. Joseph, don't be afraid to marry Mary. She has not been unfaithful to you. The baby she is expecting is there by the power of God's own Holy Spirit. She is going to give birth to a son, and God wants you to call him Jesus. For just as that name means, he will rescue people from his sins. When Joseph woke up, he did exactly what the angel told him and took Mary as his wife. Boom! But then, just like that, another surprise. The Roman ruler, Augustus, wanted to find out how many people were in his vast empire. So he ordered everyone under his control to return to their hometown to be counted.
Joseph was from Bethlehem, the town where King David once lived, so he and Mary had to travel way down south to be counted in the census. It was 90 miles or so, and they probably had to walk. It can't have been easy. When they arrived, they needed a place to stay, but so did all of Joseph's other relatives, and by the time they got to Bethlehem, all the night upstairs rooms where family usually kept their guests were full. So Mary and Joseph had to stay in a downstairs room where the animals were kept for the night. And it was there, among the animals and the straw, that Mary gave birth to Jesus. So she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger. Nearby, in the hills outside of Bethlehem, there were shepherds guarding their flocks of sheep. The night was still, the stars were shining. All was quiet, apart from the odd, sleepy sheep. And then, boom, the, the, that angel appeared again, and the light that surrounded him surrounded the shepherds too. It turned the night bright as white and gave those shepherds an almighty fright. Don't be afraid. The news I bring you is good, and it will fill everyone with joy who hears it. Today in Bethlehem, in David's city, your Saviour was born. That's right, the Messiah, the one God promised you, the one you've all been waiting for year after year after year. And this is the sign that points you to him. So you will know for sure that you found him. Look for a baby, wrapped in cloths, fit for a newborn, lying in a manger. And when the angel had said that, boom! A sky full of angels joined him. And like an otherworldly choir or a flash mob sent from heaven, they shouted out their praises to God. <laughs> then away they went as suddenly as they had appeared. And the shepherds, still shaking, said to one another, God has told us this amazing thing. Let's go and to Bethlehem and see. So off they went. Hurrying, running, racing to the place the angel had revealed to them. And there was Mary, and there was Joseph, and there was a baby, just like the angel had said, lying in a manger. So the shepherds told Mary and Joseph everything the angel had told them about the baby, how he was the Messiah, God's long-promised one, finally come to his people. And Mary kept those words, like a treasure in her heart, to wonder and to ponder over in the days and the weeks and the years to come. Then back to the hills the shepherds went, praising God for the, all that they had seen and heard. No longer quiet, no longer still, but shouting and singing like angels. Boom! Boom. The star watchers knocked on the door of the palace, the palace of King Herod. And when they were admitted, and when they stood before him, they gave him news that landed like an explosion on his ears. Can you tell us, please, where we can find the newborn King of the Jews? We saw his star rise in the night skies. We have come to worship him. It was all King Herod wanted to keep from exploding with rage. He was the King of Jews and had killed anyone who tried to take his place. The Star Watchers, of course, had no way of knowing this. They were not Jews themselves. They were from another country, far away, east of Jerusalem, for God wanted everyone, everywhere, to know about Jesus, to bless the whole world, just as he had always promised. King Herod sent the star watchers away and immediately gathered every priest and scribe and expert that he could find. Then he asked them one question and one question only. Where do our holy books say that God's long-promised Messiah will be born? In Bethlehem of Judea, they answered, for the prophet Micah says that even though it is just a little town, out of Bethlehem will come one who will be a ruler and a shepherd of his people. <laughs> <laughs> 
Search for the child, and when you have found him, come back and tell me. Because um, I want to worship him too. That was a lie, and King Herod knew it. He only wanted to find the child so he could kill him. The Star Watchers didn't know that, so off they went, following the star to Bethlehem. This way, follow me. And when it stopped and rested above the house, they knew that they had found the place. Jesus was no longer a tiny newborn baby. No, he was a little toddler living with Mary and Joseph in that house. And when the star watchers entered the house, they fell on their knees before him and worshipped him. They gave him precious gifts, gold, frankincense and myrrh, gifts fit for a king. When their visits were fi was finished, did they return to King Herod and tell him where the baby was? No, they did not. For in the night, God spoke to them in a dream that told them of the king's wicked plan. So in the morning, avoiding the palace, they re returned home by another way. We've had a lovely time celebrating the Christmas story. We do it every year, and we do it for a reason. These events don't stand on their own. They are a part of a much bigger set of events that li link back to the beginning of everything and forward to forever. Boom! They link back to the creation of the world when God made men and women to love him and each other and the world he created. They link back to the promise that God had made to that nation, that one day he would send them a king to set up God's own kingdom for everyone on earth. Jesus, the baby born to Mary, fulfilled all those promises, just as the angel had said. Descended from David, he was God's own son, sent to crush the power of evil. But that was just the beginning of the world-changing event that was his birth. For it links forward to the grown-up Jesus, who healed the sick and fed the hungry, and welcomed the outcast to show what life in God's kingdom was like. It links forward to his death, where his sacrifice took away the shame and guilt and punishment for every wrong thing that anyone would ever do. It links forward to his resurrection from the dead, where he paved the way for our resurrection. It links forward to his ascension, where he reigns at God's side. And it links forward to the coming of the Holy Spirit who lives inside everyone who follows him and helps them to live like he did. And finally, it links forward even further still through 2,000 years of history to you and to me. And then beyond to eternity, when God will make a new heaven and a new earth, he will be your king forever, our king forever. Thank you so much for being with us today and for helping us tell God's good news story. Absolutely brilliant. Well done, everyone. Love the costumes and love all that's happening. Well done. Can I just invite you all to just take a step off the platform onto the floor there? We've got to light our advent candles now. So I'm guessing that you might want to help us with that. So have a sit down on the floor. And if you'd like, we're gonna, gonna ask for some volunteers to help me. Just want to say a huge thank you to Karen and to all the children's team volunteers. Now I'm just checking the lighter is here for me. Okay, that's good. Didn't have that in the last service. Can't make fire from nothing. Um, okay, so we're going to. How many Advent candles are we lighting today? Was that you? Okay, <laughs> baby jump. Um, how many Advent candles? How many do you reckon? You think three maybe. Who agrees with three? Three would be right. I wasn't trying to trick you. Um, unfortunately, because we haven't got a morning service next week, I can't make my four candles joke. Um, yeah, three of us got that. Um, uh, anyway, so we're going to do three candles this week. So I need three superb volunteers oh my goodness there's lots of you here this morning right at the front so Ethan why don't you come up and Isla why don't you come up and one more Nathaniel why don't you come on up um 
two angels and a king. Ooh. Sorry. Why do, do you guys want to just take a step back just a little bit? Okay. Just a little aware of flammable costumes and fire. Um, so we're going to be very careful. Nathaniel, do you want to go first? Great. Can you light? Got it tight? Light this one for me. Let's see, we'll just hold it there. Good job. Isla, can you light that one there? And Ethan, you light this one this side, is that okay? Okay, thank you. Right, everyone, we'll come away from these candles to do this. So you can stand up and see how we're getting on with blowing it out. I'm keeping it nice and high. But that's ridiculously quick. You can stand back from the candles. There we go. Brilliant. Well done, everyone. Let's stand. We're going to pray for our children and young people as they go to their groups. And just to say for our teenagers, our young people, um, there's a change of venue just for this week. So younger youth, you're going to be going across the road to 23 Littlewood Close and upper room are going to be in the balcony room. Uh, so if you're in younger youth, you're going across the road. Uh, if you're at upper room, you're in the balcony room. So just to let you know that. And the rest of the children are going to go and have a bit of a Christmas party. So have a great time, all of you. And we're going to continue in worship before we pray together. So let me pray. Jesus, thank you for the wonder of Christmas, for the story of Jesus coming to us. And we pray, Father, that for all of our children and young people, they would be able to celebrate deeply and wonderfully this Christmas, your birth and your love for us. Amen. We're going to worship and we'll see you all a little later.
my feet. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Your name is like honey on my lips. Your spirit like water to my soul. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Your name is like honey on my lips. Your spirit like water to my soul. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Jesus, Lamb of God, receive our adoration, how wonderful you are.
Thank you, Lord. Receive our adoration because you are God. You're eternal God. You're a faithful God. You're a spirit. It is declared that you are light. It is declared that you are love. You're the invisible God. You're unsearchable. You're incorruptible. You're eternal. From everlasting to everlasting, you remain the same. Our confidence and our love is in you, knowing that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever you remain the same. So, Father, we, your children, we come into your presence, Lord, at this time, just to say thank you for being God. Thank you that you are faithful. Thank you that you are worthy of praise and adoration. Thank you that you are the only wise one. Thank you that you're the most high. You're perfect. You're holy. You're just, you're true, and you're upright. You're faithful, and you're merciful. So, Father God, this morning, as we come in your presence, Lord, thank you for being here with us, because you said we're two or three are gathered in your name that you are here. So, Lord, we thank you for being here. Lord, I pray for every single soul, every single heart here, Lord. Minister to them. Lord, you know what's going on in our hearts and our minds. You know what's going on in our homes. Lord, you know what's going on in those private spaces and areas, Lord. But, Lord, we, we pray, Holy Spirit, we give you permission to come into every single area, Lord, and shine your light. Because when your light comes in, darkness must flee. You are light. And Father God, this morning, again, we want to thank you for your faithfulness to us, Lord. Specifically, Lord, I want to pray, um, just referencing um, John chapter 1, 1 John. And 1 John makes it very clear. 1 John says that uh, the incarnation of the word of life. It says that that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and we testify to it and we proclaim it to eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have seen and heard so that you, are also, that so you may also worship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Father God, this time of the year, you make this joy complete because of your promise that you made to your children. Thank you for the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the light. Thank you for your word made flesh. Thank you for all that you have done and continue to do for us. Lord, yes, we see and we hear what's going on around the world. Tensions in the Middle East continue. Likewise, in the, in the Far East, tensions with China and Taiwan. Lord, there's tension everywhere, but Father God, you are light. We pray for all those, Lord, who are in positions of responsibility and authority. All the conversations, discussions that are going on, trying to Ease the tensions, Father God. Bring peace, especially at this time, Father God. I pray, give them wisdom. Give them courage. Give them strength. And may they have the right set of men and women working with them for their salvation. And Father, for closer home, Lord, we want to thank you for our loved ones. Lord, you know, this year has been quite challenging for some of us, Lord, in this congregation and further afield. But you are still God because nothing happens without your say-so. The conclusion of COP28, Father God, and the agreements, the cost of living crisis, Father God, so much going on. We pray, Father God, likewise, for the uh, National Health Service, the doctors, the nurses, we see this COVID variants, Lord. Hospitals are struggling. Lord, there's so much going on, but you are still God, you are still light. You are still light, you are still in control, and you'll always be in control. So our confidence is in you and in you alone. Thank you, Father God, that we can celebrate this, this time with you. In Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Felix.
Well, you'll be relieved to know, as we've done a couple of notices already, this won't take too long. Um, so just to highlight a, um, a couple of things that's starting in the new year. So uh, obviously tonight we've got Carols by Candlelight and our Christmas service is coming up. But um, I want to highlight a couple of things in the new year. Firstly, on the 7th of January, it's Sunday night. Uh, really excited to welcome Bishop Mike Royal is coming to speak. Um, Mike is a Pentecostal bishop based in Birmingham. Um, has work, worked leading churches, leading networks of churches, but also um, uh, kind of worked very much in uh, the kind of area of social justice, whether that's with been TLG, working with children who've been excluded, or CAP, um, and other organisations. So it's going to be a brilliant evening. So that's our New Wine celebration in January. And fast forward a couple of days after that is our Vision Night, um, Tuesday the 9th of January from 7.45 here at St Paul's. Um, in previous years, we have um, kind of had different groups of hosted tables and cooked food, um, and this year because um, we've got so many new folk who've joined who aren't part of groups uh, we thought we'd do something a little bit differently so um, if you like to bake or could bake cakes cookies brownies or something like that we'd love you to bring them along for vision night because all of us would have started our running regimes our hardcore dieting and everything else so we would we, we, by the 9th of January we'll need a day off so come that night uh, with a huge plate ready to eat as much cake as you can um, share drinks and uh, um, refresh Freshments around tables and and um, the evening's not just going to be me telling you what we're going to do because that wouldn't be an evening to come to. Uh, what we're going to do is explore together, pray together, dream and imagine together what God is kind of around what God we think God might be saying to us as a church. We're not coming with a blank kind of piece of paper. There's um, some thoughts and reflections around what we think God's saying, but would love us to invite to be part of uh, seeking God for what he's saying to us in the next season. So the main thing is it's the 9th of January. Get it in your diaries. I uh, would love everyone to be there. And if you were up for baking or bringing some cakes, uh, cookies or, or brownies or whatever, that would be amazing. So that's on the 9th. And just to say, um, Tamlin's going to tell us, uh, Nick and Tamlin are going to talk a little bit about one of the groups, um, Parenting Teens, that we're doing. But thank you so much to all those of you who've signed up to lead groups. We've got 20 uh, groups starting in the new year, which is incredible, uh, which also gives us an amazing choice of groups to uh, join and be part of. So um, we're, we're kind of, uh, that, the, those sign-ups will be available from the new year, but that's just a really exciting thing to say. Chris, I think we all know, what are you baking? Me? Yeah. <laughs> um, wow, that has really put me on the spot because I only know how to do bacon and egg rolls. So I'm not sure that works oh, in the kind of okay. baking thing. Um, I will bake something that someone else has baked and bring it with me. <laughs> Sorry. That's a non-answer. Thanks for that, Tam, though. Well, I, I, would return, I would return the question, but it's unkind and unfair to I'll ask. I'll some brownies. Put someone on the spot. You're making brownies? Yeah. Oh, it's annoying. <laughs> I should have been prepared for that. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm going to invite Nick up because we have, as we've just said, we have different groups coming, um, starting in the new term. And one of those groups that we are going to be hosting, well, Nick and Amanda Taylor are going to be hosting, is Parenting Teens Course. So, Nick, why don't you just tell us a little bit about it? Okay, um, is my oh, mic got, on? Oh, I've come okay. prepared. Um, <laughs> I don't know very much about the course. Amanda is, Amanda is very much the leader, and I am the trusted assistant. So, I will do my best. She's not here this morning, so. Unfortunately, you're going to have to settle for me. Um, yeah, it's much like our parenting. I don't really know what's going on. I just do what she tells me. I'm not really joking. Um, we are starting a course, Parenting Teens. So if you are a parent with a teenager, you are more than welcome to come along. If you are a parent who has a child who will soon become a teenager, you are more than welcome to come along. It's, uh, what we're doing is we recognize that it's a time when your beautiful child who has done everything you've asked them to do um, and the apple of your eye becomes someone different and it can be really challenging. So um, I think a lot of people may feel that you either you have two choices, right? You could either stamp the life out of them and make sure that they are uh, obedient or you can just let go and just say, look, they've got their own, their own mates, they've got their phone or whatever it is um, and we just kind of do this. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to help um, us as parents establish that connection with your teenager and keep that connection because it's not the time of letting go and it's not the time of being the oppressive parent and making sure that they are being obedient at all times. It's a really tricky time. So six weeks, I think, is it? Six weeks. Okay. Starting the 25th of Jan and you do need to sign up. There are limited spaces. So I do encourage people to sign up as soon as they can. It's £10 a, per a person. And um, yeah, I'm sure they'd love to see you there. Did I do it okay? Was there anything that else? That was perfect. Okay. <laughs> Great, thanks, Nick. 
So we're going to have our reading now, and I'm going to invite Anya to come up, and then Nick's going to come back up and speak to us today. Thank you. Thank you, Tamlin. Um, so the reading is from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2 to 7. That's Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2 to 7. <clears throat> the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoiced when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for fire. For to us, a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish it. Amen. Nick, come on up. Let's pray for Nick as he comes to speak this morning. Father, thank you so much for Nick. Thank you for this scripture that we refer to so often at this time of year. But Father, may we see through the familiarity and see you, Lord Jesus, afresh. So anoint Nick with your spirit. Speak through him to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Morning. That was perfect. That was perfect. Our wonderful teenagers in Upper Room are having their Christmas party this morning. And uh, I've told them, make sure you make as much noise as possible just to show us how much fun you're having. What I didn't tell them is I'm going to ask you to make as much noise as possible to show them how much... No, I'm joking. That's not how church goes, I don't think. Um, okay, where are we? Isaiah, Isaiah. Um, easy predictions, easy predictions. Some things in life are easy to predict, right? Some things you can just see it coming a mile off. Sometimes you have an inkling something is going to happen. Sometimes it's just really straightforward. It's an easy prediction. A few years ago, I turned 40. I was given a skateboard for my birthday. <laughs> Why are you laughing, Chris? <laughs> you can see it's an easy prediction, right? Uh, I was given a skateboard for my 40th birthday. It wasn't a random present. I asked for it. When I was younger, I used to skate a lot. So turning 40, I figured maybe I should reconnect with the younger me. Some people called it a midlife crisis. I'd prefer to call it a renaissance. But it had been a long time since I'd last skated, so I had to start from scratch, get down to the skate park called Padded Up, and start to learn again. And eventually I built up the confidence to go into the bowl, onto the half pipe, and do a few little things. And every now and then I did something I was quite proud of, and I'd send a video to my friends, because I'm that annoying person who's still seeking acceptance from his mates, even at the age of 40. And um, the good thing about old friends, really old friends who've known you for a long time, is that they're not afraid to speak the truth in a situation. So they would quite quickly come back to me and say, mate, what are you doing? 40-year-old in the skate park, have you not got a job? But also what they did say was that they said with all confidence how they felt that my new life wasn't going to end well for me. Mate, you're definitely going to break something. But my denial was strong. I came back with, look, you've known me for years. You know I can fall down really well. I've done it all my life. I know how to fall. And I'm, I'm quite a good faller. Until one fateful Sunday morning at the skate park where I didn't fall so well and I managed to break two bones in the same leg. It was an easy prediction. It was inevitable, even though I denied it. When we read our passage this morning, we read what Isaiah is saying. 
this is not an easy prediction. It's a very different situation. This is as out there as it gets. For a start, Isaiah is writing this about at least 750 years before Jesus is born. Yet it's written with such confidence and such assuredness, and we're so familiar with it that sometimes I think we can forget just how mind-boggling this all is. For a start, it's not even a prediction. It's not a best guess. Isaiah isn't saying, Do you know, I think perhaps maybe the light of the world will come. This is an assured God-given vision of what God intends for us. A light has dawned. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living on the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. One of the first indications of Christmas time, of course, is lights. Our houses, our offices, our churches, our streets are filled with lights. And it's fitting because, of course, Christmas, if you're living in this part of the world, falls in the darkest time of year. As we see in our passage this morning, Isaiah describes the world as a land of darkness. Christmas contains many spiritual truths, but I think it's very hard to understand the others if we don't first grasp this first truth, and that is that the world is a dark place. And we will never find our way out of it or see reality unless Jesus is our light. So, how is the world dark? The word dark refers both to evil and ignorance. What was happening in the time of Jesus' birth? Violence, abuse of power, homelessness, refugees fleeing oppression, families ripped apart and bottomless grief and suffering. Sounds a lot like our world today. When we read the news, or if we watch it on TV, we can see that darkness is all around us. And it can be overwhelming. You don't put the news on, do you, if you want to have a good evening. It's not entertainment. It's pretty heavy stuff. In our house, we sometimes start watching the news, and maybe after 15, 20 minutes, we think, do you know what? I think we need to turn this off, because it's getting a bit heavy. It's all around us, isn't it? I don't know if you read about the murder of Shakira Spencer. This was a while ago, well, not that long ago, but the, uh, the trial was in the Old Bailey about three weeks ago. If you don't know about Shakira Spencer, this was a woman who was murdered. She was treated as a slave, stripped of her identity. She was abused, beaten, tortured, and eventually murdered. And this all happened just a few streets away in West Ealing. We can easily get very distracted by the beautifulness of Christmas, and we live in a nice area, don't we, where everyone decorates their houses, the shops look lovely. But amidst all of that, we are living in darkness. It's not just on the news. It's not just on the television. It's here. It's in our neighborhood. And it's real. The other way the world is dark is ignorance. We can recognize the evil around us, but no one knows enough to eradicate the suffering and bring peace. In verse 2, we see that the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. But we can really see the significance of that statement if we read the previous chapter, in chapter 8, where Isaiah is saying that the people are seeking magicians and mediums instead of turning to God. Then the chapter ends, distressed and hungry, they will walk through the land. Then they will look to the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. So what's going on here? We see that the people are looking toward the earth and human resources to fix the problems that they see. They're looking to the mystics, the scholars, the experts for solutions to their problems. They can see the darkness, they're not blind to it, but they seek to fix it themselves under their own steam. And some people make the same claims today. Some people put their hope in humanity. John Lennon once implored anyone who would listen to give peace a chance. 
Maybe, that's it. Maybe if we all listened to well-intentioned celebrities and did what they said, that would be the answer. Maybe we should all just give peace a chance. That's it. Other people look to experts to provide the answers. Elon Musk, smart guy. Maybe he will be our savior. Maybe not. But his cars are cool, right? His cars are cool. Have you seen the SpaceX rocket? Have you seen? You know NASA? NASA, they're pretty clever people, right? They used to just dump their rockets in the ocean and then just have to try and find them. Elon Musk has designed a rocket that can carefully park itself vertically back on the launch pad. That's pretty smart. If he can do that, maybe he can work out how to generate endless clean energy and solve the problems that we see. But it's Elon Musk, so probably not. Other people look to scientists, don't they, to provide the answers. Maybe the scientists will work out how to capture the carbon and help us in that way. Or we pray for our leaders when they're going to the COP conferences and we pray that they will be able to help make decisions and policies that will make a difference. Maybe we're holding all hope in their ability to rescue us from the desperate plight and reverse the disastrous effects of global warming. Maybe the government will sort everything out. The slogan for the last Conservative Party conference was long-term decisions for a brighter future. Sounds good, right? Maybe, maybe you trust the decisions of our government. Maybe you think they are making those decisions because you believe that they're going to work out for everyone in the long term. Maybe you lean slightly more to the left and you read the Labour slogan, which is build a better Britain. And you think that sounds more achievable. Talking about making a better Britain, in America, some people wear hats. They wear hats that say, make America great again. Does anyone own one of those hats? No? You wouldn't, probably wouldn't admit it. Because if you wore one of those hats, you'd get a lot of heat, right? And in America, even, you'd get a lot of heat depending on where you are. But the phrase, make America great again, in itself is not that, it's not that bad, is it? Make America great again? But of course, the question is, who is going to make America great again? Is it Trump? Is it Biden? Is it Jeff Bezos? Barack Obama, do you remember him? I love the Obamas, the good old days. Barack Obama made most of America believe that yes, we can. Yes, we can. But if we understand the Bible, if we read Isaiah, and we know the true meaning of Christmas is no, we can't. And I'm not just saying that we should give up. Don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying that we should give up. Of course, we should give peace a chance. We should build a better Britain. We should try to make long-term decisions for a brighter future. But we also need to recognize that we are walking in the land of darkness. We live in the land of deep darkness, and we cannot find the solutions in this world. Maybe we already know that. Maybe we already know that we can't seek the answers from celebrities, from politicians, from experts and scientists. So we look to fix the smaller problems closer to home. We look at our own lives and we think, perhaps my life wouldn't be so dark if I got the right education, if I marry the right person, if I have the right job, the right acquaintances, if I eat the right food, if I read the right newspapers, if I go to the right gym, if I buy the right house in the right area, if I recycle my waste and I don't use single-use plastics and I never switch the heating on, and if I never use paper and I never wear cotton and I never wear Nikes, if I go on holiday in my back garden because I can still make it a holiday of the mind, if I can do those things, if I can get those things right and in place, then I can achieve peace in my life. And again, I'm not saying those things aren't good. Recycling is obviously the right thing to do, and education is good. And if you feel convicted to pitch a tent in your back garden, that's your choice. But if we're banking on those things, if we are really putting and investing everything in those things to bring light into our lives and to counter the darkness, then I'm afraid Isaiah is right. 
we are destined to be people who look to the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and we will be thrust into utter darkness. Merry Christmas. I do like Christmas, I promise I do. There is, there is an up part. We've gone, we've gone deep into the ravine and now we are going to start ascending up because what is the message of Christmas? What is Isaiah saying? Yes, the world is dark and we cannot save ourselves. In fact, if we hold on to the, the belief that we can save ourselves, it will only lead to more darkness. The message of Christmas, what Isaiah is saying, is that things really are this bad. Things really are this dark. However, however, there is hope. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of darkness, a light has dawned. There is light outside of this world. And that light has been brought to save us. In fact, Jesus himself is that light. When Isaiah speaks of God's great light dawning on the dark world, he uses the sun as a metaphor. And the sun gives us life, truth, and beauty. The sun gives us life. We all know that if the sun didn't rise, all life on earth as we know it would cease to exist. The sun is the source of life on earth. The sun gives us truth. The sun shows us the truth. It reveals things as they really are. I remember arriving on a holiday a few years ago, and we arrived at night, really late at night, and it was very dark, and I didn't have a clue where I was. And things all seemed a bit shady and a bit strange, and I was beginning to feel very responsible for my family on this holiday that we had booked, thinking, where on earth are we? It wasn't until the morning when we were able to walk out onto the balcony and you could see where we were, suddenly you could relax. Okay, this is gonna be a good week. You could see the sea, you could see the sun shine, you could see the green fields, you could see the early holiday makers making their way to the pool with their towels under their arms. I'm not gonna say where they're from. <laughs> and you could see the palm trees and you could hear the birds. The sun had revealed the truth of where we were. The sun also brings us beauty and joy. The sun, or lack of, can affect us in profound ways. At this time of year, when the sun is furthest from us, it can really, really affect us. I think I'm not the only one in here. Do you find it easier to wake up in the morning in mid-June and July? when you can hear the birds and you can feel the sun streaming through your window and the, the trees are in bloom or maybe it's just a beautiful, you just, or do you feel it easier to wake up in mid-December when it's pitch black and it's freezing cold and the heating hasn't quite kicked in yet? Which one is easier, right? It's, at this time of year, things are just slightly different. I know that I'm a different person in the winter. Amanda, my wife, is constantly telling me, you're a different person in the winter. She doesn't say it with a frown, not like that. <laughs> Maybe I should read. She says, you're a different person in winter. That's how she says it. The reality is that when it's cold and it's dark and it's wet, I heard that on the, on the weather the other day and I thought, there are three words I do not want to hear this morning. Cold, wet, dark. So, oh my goodness, it's going to be a long day. It's going to be a long day. But the reality is that that is true. And... If I'm really honest, I can get into a slightly depressive state at this time of year. I just, it's like the batteries are on half and you're just kind of just getting through. And last year was particularly difficult, so this year I'm really gonna try and be a bit more chipper. I'm taking my vitamin D tablets because I know that I'm not getting enough natural sunlight. Amanda, on the other hand, she's an Irish redhead. And did you know that, this is a scientific fact, redheads can generate vitamin D with far less sunlight than other people. So she's so smug, she's fine, she doesn't care. She's like, get over it, it's just winter. So this is becoming like a, a pattern of conversation within our marriage to the point where we felt like, do you know what, let's put some science behind this. Let's do a DNA test and find out where we're really from. You know, if you ask me where I'm from, I'm a, a Londoner, I was born in London, I was raised in London, I've lived in London all my life. I'm a Londoner, that's where I'm from. But where am I really from? 
Where am I really from? Where's my roots? Where, you know, I know where my parents are from, but we know now, thanks to science, that we can go way back. There's a bigger, bigger story. So we did this DNA test, and it turns out, listen to this, turns out my DNA is 40% Nigerian. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, 13% Sierra Leonean, 13% Iberian, and only 14% British. Hey, I'm 3% Jewish. Amanda, by the, by the way, on the other hand, this is her, Amanda is 98% Irish. <laughs> it's like, um, how, can you, how can you get that? Anyway. So it's no wonder that I don't fare so well at this time of year. Of course, my, bio, my biological coordinates are set too far north. My DNA is obviously homesick. <laughs> we all need the sun, right? We all need the sun. And it's why it's such a great metaphor. We all know it. And it's as relevant today as it was when Isaiah first wrote it. Yet, it's still only a metaphor. We know that the light of God is more powerful than our sun. For a start, we know that our sun isn't even the most powerful light in our universe. Of all the stars that we found and charted, we know that our sun is actually just a medium average sized star. There are some whoppers out there, some of them up to 100 times bigger than our sun. How much brighter are they? And if God made those stars, and the even bigger ones that we haven't yet discovered, how much brighter is he? I think of Moses on Mount Sinai where he asked to see God's face and God said, no one can see my face and live to tell the tale. In Exodus 33, Moses says, come on God, show us your face. I'm paraphrasing. And God says, Moses, I'd love to. I really would, mate, but you would die. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll hide you in a crevice, I'll cover you with my hand, and I'll allow all of my goodness to pass by. And I will proclaim my name over you. And when I've gone, you can then see where I've been. No peeking. And we read that Moses came down from the mountain having spent time with God, and his face is literally radiant. His face is glowing, so much so that his friends and people around him tell him, you've got to cover that up because I can't be around you. Imagine that. Imagine your friend's face is glowing like a light bulb. Imagine to the point where you say, look, come on, mate, you're giving me a headache. I love this. This is such a beautiful description of the magnificence of God's glory. He is the source of life. God alone has the life, the truth, and the joy that we lack and cannot generate ourselves. So, how do we respond to this light? There are many implications to God being born into our world. But let's look at three this morning. Firstly, if God really was born, if Jesus really is the mighty God and everlasting Father, we can't just like him. The people who actually saw Jesus when we read the Gospels, the people who actually interacted with him, they all had a pretty extreme response. They were either furious with him and rebuked him, or they knelt down and they worshipped him. There isn't a single account of anyone liking him. No one said, I like him. He want, makes me want to live a better life. You know, he's just so inspiring. No one said, I love his teachings, but I don't buy the whole God bit. If the baby born at Christmas is the mighty God, then the only true response is to trust him completely, to recognize him as the light that we need, to admit that we cannot do this ourselves, and to make him God of our lives. Secondly, if Jesus is wonderful counselor and prince of peace, then we should want to serve him and make him the God of our lives. Jesus isn't just a mighty God. He is also our counselor. 
He's not just a life force. He isn't a mysterious spirit or a big man sitting on a cloud. If the baby born at Jesus is God, then we have a God who truly understands us, who knows the human condition, who has been through what we are going through. He knows what it's like to experience poverty, to be abandoned by friends, to be shunned by the in crowd, to be crushed by injustice, to be tortured and to die. Jesus knows what it's like to walk in the land of darkness, to live in the land of deep darkness. He's done it, and he walks alongside us. He is our counselor, and he is wonderful. Thirdly, and lastly, he is a gift. Notice Isaiah doesn't just say, for to us a child is born. He says, to us a son is given. In verse 5, we read that every warrior's boot used in battle, every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. This is imagery of a great battle. We no longer need to do the fighting ourselves. We no longer need the armor or the sword. Burn them up. We've got someone else to do our fighting for us. I'm going to invite the band back up and to get ready in whatever it is you do before you start playing your instruments. And surely I'm going to ask Chris up to join me. But our response this morning, as we walk in the darkness, as we live in the land of deep darkness, the light that is Jesus is offered to us as a gift. And I encourage you to recognize him and to receive him to allow him to come into your life, to walk alongside you, to be your wonderful counselor and bring you peace. And we prepare to put down our swords, to stop trying to fix things ourselves. The darkness is real. And trusting Jesus this morning is not ignoring the problems and difficulties that we face. Trusting Jesus this morning is not pretending that everything is perfect. It isn't pretending that the world is rainbows and cupcakes. It isn't abandoning our problems. It's inviting him into our lives, into the darkness, and asking him to reveal his truth, to breathe his life, to give us joy. I think of the verse in 1 Peter chapter 2, where we read, we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness and into his wonderful light. So I'm going to ask you to stand as we respond this morning. You may want to close your eyes. Just stand in a posture of acceptance. You may want to put your hands out, put your hand on your chest, however you feel comfortable. I just want to pray for us this morning. Lord, this morning we know we are walking in the midst of darkness. We can see the darkness all around us, and yet we praise you and we thank you that by your grace you offer us your love. We thank you that we can receive your light. And wherever we are this morning, whether we're feeling oppressed, whether we're suffering an injustice, whether we're worried, if there's something troubling us, if we're feeling anxious, if we're restless, if we feel like we're in a hopeless situation, if we're struggling with our physical health, if we're struggling with our emotional well-being. If there's anything else on our hearts, Lord, this morning, Lord, we offer this to you, our wonderful counselor, and we ask you to give us peace. Lord, fill us with your spirit. Let us see your glory this morning. Like Moses, we want to see you face to face, but we'll settle for seeing where your goodness has been. We want you to cover us with your hand 
and declare your name on us, on each one of us. We want to be glowing with your glory. Yeah, fill us in you, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill us afresh now with your loving kindness and your presence. something that I think Nick articulated really well is that the light always overcomes the darkness. And I don't know about you, but often in life it's that feeling of being disempowered. How can this little light of mine make a difference in any shape or way in our world? We've got challenges we face in our own lives. We're praying for our children. We're praying for our community. We uh, worried for our jobs, we're facing all of those challenges. What can my the light of Christ in me really do? And I feel like God, by His Spirit today, wants to restore courage and confidence to us again. That it's it's not by might or by our power, but by His Spirit. So I'm going to pray that over us. Matt and the team are going to sing our final song in a moment. And, but if you'd like prayer for that, particularly this morning or anything else, then we'd love to invite you to come. But Father, over each one of us, may our confidence in you, in you, in us, the hope of glory, grow. Those scenarios and challenges we're praying for, where we feel like we're making no difference, remind us again that in your name, everything must bow. So Holy Spirit, breathe your life upon us. Give us confidence, hope and faith for all that we're facing, for all that we're doing. Amen. Mm -hmm. So as we worship, if you'd like to come for prayer, make your way to the front. It'd be lovely to pray with you. Um, we're going to sing our final song as we do that.
singing over us with your love. You're the song of compassion. You're the song of forgiveness. Shoulder to shoulder, you stand with us. You're the song of compassion. You're the song of forgiveness. Shoulder to shoulder, you stand with us. You're the song of compassion. You're the song of forgiveness. Shoulder to shoulder, you stand with us. For you came for us. For you came for us. You are singing over us with your love. For you came for us. For you came for us. Are singing over us with your love. For you care for us, for you care for us. You are singing over us with your love. For you care for us, for you care for us. You are singing over us with your love. Lord, we just thank you for your love. We thank you that you're the light in the darkness. Lord, I just pray that as we go into this week ahead, Lord, that we'll know of you as the Prince of Peace that we'll know your peace in each one of our lives. So bless us, we pray. Amen. That draws us to the end of the service. It's lovely to see you. If you are new here for the first time, please do come say hi afterwards at the welcome desk. If giving is part of your regular act of worship, there are baskets and contactless giving at the back. And if you need a last minute Christmas present, our bookshop is open and has some wonderful books. So why don't you have a look there? We hope to see you later today at our carol services.